and they were worn pretty thin, see? Some of, them, some of us had even cut holes in them for, for air where we'd impregnated those things with that uh, gook we used to put on them to uh, waterproof them, see? And your feet would sweat in those things, so we'd cut holes in those. Well, that was a stupid thing to do going into Bastogne because the snow would get in there and like that. We had limited, limited ammunition, and that was one of the things, too, that we lacked was ammunition. We just didn't have time to, to get supplied full ammo. Bastogne needed relief. General Patton's army was 100 miles to the south. George S. Patton had a sense of history and the will to make himself a place in it. He was already preparing his main chance, an attack that could propel him into Berlin. When he got wind of the German breakthrough, he feared Ike and Bradley were going to steal away his troops to plug holes in the Ardennes. But it didn't take him long to recognize an opportunity for glory. He told Ike he could pivot most of his attack force within 48 hours and sent word to Bastogne his army was on its way. On the 22nd of December, when we were totally surrounded, some German officers under a white flag of truce came into our glider regiment with a paper demanding our surrender and telling us all the bad things that would happen if we didn't. And we went in to General McAuliffe, who was taking a little much-needed nap at that point. And General McAuliffe mistakenly thought that this was some Germans who wanted to surrender to us. But we disabused him of that thought very quickly and said, no, uh, they want us to surrender. And Tony McAuliffe then said, uh, us surrender? Oh, nuts. And then he went on and he said, well, uh, I wonder if we ought to answer him, and we all felt that it required an answer. And I spoke up and said, well, what you first said would be hard to beat. And Tony said, what do you mean? And I said, you said nuts. So he took a pencil and wrote to the German commander, nuts, exclamation point, A.C. McAuliffe commanding. When the surrender ultimatum uh, was learned of, it was apparently a good morale booster for the American public. The American press every day was showing a, uh, a picture of the bulge with only Bastogne. In the white and all the rest of it was uh, German and uh, we were still holding out and that was about the only good news there was. Bastogne n'avait strictement aucune importance. The town of Bastogne had no military importance. The proof of it was in the plan of attack. There wasn't even a plan to take the town itself. The Germans got taken into the game. Once they saw Bastogne was becoming for America a symbol of resistance, then the Germans set out to destroy that symbol. Hitler made it plain to his commanders, Bastogne must be taken. He released every spare man to the cause. German artillery flattened the town. Tanks and infantry attacked from every side. There was no way to evacuate the American wounded. Medical supplies were used up. Doctors operated behind makeshift curtains. For anesthetic, they use cognac. This growing drama was not lost on Patton. He radioed ahead. He would crack through on Christmas Day. Patton was a rather mercurial kind of a guy. Uh, very flashy. They used to say that he was the best ass kicker in the United States Army. <laughs> From his command post in Luxembourg City, Patton ordered his men to attack night and day. His army neared the southern flank of the bulge at a gallop. But two days before Christmas, the weather upstaged him. The 
weather clear and the planes could start flying again. Planes were coming over by the hundreds. You'd see 36 in a group, 36 more, 36 more. And I don't know how many hundreds. And we just look up at the sky and say, thank goodness they are flying again. And see those guys diving down and strafing. We knew they were hitting tanks. And, and that's what's keeping the crowds moving and keeping them busy. And this happened from daylight to dark. Hitler had gambled everything in the Ardennes his best troops, his new reserves, hundreds of new tanks, and his meager supply of fuel. But he'd always known that wasn't enough. He'd also counted on bad weather. And after seven days, his luck had run out. The German offensive stalled out. The Allies held the northern shoulder. In the south, the southern shoulder was held. The Germans were constricted to that 80-mile base and driving toward Antwerp, they got no farther than just within sight of the Meuse River. Net effect was it died right there. That was the end of it. Patton's army got to Bastogne the day after Christmas, and they opened up enough of a hole for the press to squeeze through, along with the morale troops and the metal pinners. McAuliffe and the 101st were the pride of the American army. But the price of an earlier pride was also on display. An army which had held itself unstoppable had suffered 4,000 dead in the bulge by Christmas. 30,000 more Americans had been wounded or taken prisoner. The SS had executed hundreds of unarmed American prisoners, and in the town of Stavelo, more than 100 Belgian civilians. The Americans had given up a pocket of land 50 miles deep, it would take them a whole month to win it back. Your imagination kind of runs away with you, I guess, especially when you hear noises. And of course, at night it was worse because you really didn't know what was happening. We were very much afraid of the dark. We couldn't see the danger. And so as the light begins to come, it's beautiful. It, it provides you at least a view of what's going to happen. And you know what's going to happen in terms of the battle. Meet the German drive, General Eisenhower here at Supreme Headquarters resourcefully regroups his forces, giving Field Marshal Montgomery complete command over the entire northern sector. With Britain's famous Monty...